Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik, and this time I am joined by uh, two friends of mine, Ator and Flashy. Yo, what's up? Long time no see! I thought that it would be interesting to talk about what each of us considers to be some of the best and some of the worst anti-communist arguments. Well, for me, these maybe have changed. Maybe in the past I thought that certain arguments were better, and now I think that they're really not. And I asked a bunch of different people, and I got surprisingly different answers. Let's start with the worst arguments. Maybe Flashy can say one, and then Ator can say one. Uh, Yeah, sure. I mean, I think one of the worst arguments is the ones that you hear most often, um, which is obviously, you know, uh, communism will never work because of human nature. I think people that bring that up are just people who not only have not even read the theory, but don't even give thought to like what it means. I agree that the some of the more popular ones tend to be somehow the worst arguments. Ator, what's your opinion on the whole communism doesn't work because of human nature argument? I mean, it's probably one of the worst arguments, probably, up there. Because humans are always change like the nature of humanity has like changed so much over the past couple of like centuries and decades that really you could make up that the argument about any kind of system R- right now you could say that like capitalism doesn't work because of human nature because it's just like humans are becoming more and more intertwined with each other because the barriers that we had before are being broken because of stuff like the internet. We're becoming more and more international and more and more connected to each other, leading to a more collectivist sense of thought, you know, in society. It's just sort of one of those things that people just say as if it's self-evident. Like, it's a truism that, oh, communism doesn't work because of human nature, but or, com- or communism goes against human nature, but then when you start to think about it well what does it what does that even mean like communism or i mean i suppose they actually mean socialism but socialism it worked just fine like it worked it existed for a long time like on a day to day level it functioned just fine uh without any massive crisis like every single day or every single week or or anything like that it's just empirically blatantly false, and then it assumes that human nature is something like what? Historically, people used to say that slavery was in accordance with human nature, and uh, trying to free free the slaves was against human nature, or that the feudal system was in accordance with human nature. Now they say capitalism is in accordance with human nature, but I mean, it doesn't really seem like a very good argument yeah it's a really horrible argument it, it's pretty funny because it's literally like a baseline like communist like idea of uh, like you know the base and the superstructure so like human nature has changed throughout society like hey already said uh like and the things that they are talking about when they talk about human nature they're usually <laughs> talking about like aspects of the superstructure which you know are like basically like shaped and maintained by the base itself so like changing the mode of production will inevitably have effects on the superstructure, even though, you know, there's still work to be done. Like, uh, if we talk about, like, Gramsci and stuff like that, um, how, you know, even after we do change the base, there is still work to be done on the superstructure. So, of course, there's still work to be done. But, I mean, even if we read, like, Marx, like, and, like, Critique of the Gotha Program or something like that, like, he t- he goes into, like, bourgeois right, you know? Like, it's not something that he just, like, puts in there, like, by himself, like, at... No, he he actually like looks at materially like just what's going to be inevitable like in the in the exact like moment after we uh, like abolish capitalism, you know? Like there's still going to be elements of capitalism within the lower stage of communism. So like if it, if you actually read like just the most basic like Marxist theory, like this isn't even a problem. That's why it's one of the worst arguments. In some sense like Communism is much more natural to human beings than, like, capitalism ever will, because it just goes, like, in our in our favor as a collective species. 
when people actually lived in like so-called in the state of nature when they lived in tribes they lived communistically and that uh was in accordance with human nature but um th they were not alienated on a societal level of course they were at the mercy of the natural elements like the the environment because they didn't have technology and they couldn't control the environment but on a societal level they were not alienated now in capitalism it's the other way around now we have technology so we can control nature pretty well but the society is completely alienating and we can't control market forces and those kinds of things and now that has turned against us but in future socialism and communism we're gonna get the best of both worlds where we will be able to control nature to the necessary degree and also control society rationally i mean the whole human nature argument like it just relies on this really dumbed down idea of uh, it presupposes that communism requires people to be absolute saints who will sacrifice everything for the good of just everybody else which is not something that communism requires. We don't need that to be the case. Communism has, you know, it still has a society and structures and, and other people that keep other people in line. It's not uh, necessary or required that everybody has to be some kind of saint for the society to function. Then it assumes that people are innately somehow just selfish or flawed. Yeah, that's partially true. People are a little bit selfish, but not only selfish. And is selfishness real? Is, is that really like that means that capitalism is uh, natural then? Because people are a little bit selfish sometimes. It's just like it, it's, you know, doesn't really logically hold together. Yeah, it's the most ridiculous idea to try to claim that capitalism is in line with human nature and communism is not. All we have to do is go back to like. Uh, like the Great Depression era, like uh, there's like very famous like photos uh, of like people in the U.S. like farmers and stuff like just dumping milk and like throwing away fruit like food, like b simply because like it would cost them less or it would cost them less money to just throw it away than to actually sell it. Like the idea of that happening naturally, like people just throwing away valuable resources. Like could you imagine like in old like tribal days, people just throwing fucking money away <laughs> or like or throw throwing um food and like uh, water and like any other type of resource away because like they couldn't sell it for a higher price than what they had Th that's yeah. nonsensical it's yeah. nonsensical it's absurd so what about you wait or what do you think is the worst argument i think the worst argument is whenever this is much more i'd say this is much more common around here in south america as an argument but i've seen like like people in the first world like talk about it is that like communism will get, bring starvation and poverty to like your country if it's installed in it and i think it's very funny that like conservatives and liberals use this argument especially in my country that is brazil considering that right now the government has actually put in us back into the hunger map uh, starvation as a phenomena has came has come back to Brazil after like nearly twenty years of not being registered here, like very widely. So you know, like it's very funny that they say that like communism is going to like bring poverty and starvation, but you know, like starvation itself is being brought back due to like economic reforms. They're, they're made to like increase capitalist profits. Not only that, but we're also like seeing like records of like uh, extreme poverty coming back as well. You know, we, we have misery around just increasing like in these years after reform after reform of, you know, just neoliberal and like conservative governments just like doing reform saying that like, oh, we're going to bring back the economy after those evil leftists like destroyed it, but then they just like leave everything up more in shambles. You know, I'd say it's a very funny argument that they use, but then they themselves end up actually doing that, just bringing misery all around. 
there there are some articles that I'll that I'll put in the description about these topics that I just said. Yeah, and it just doesn't. Um, it's not empirically true to say that like communism just causes starvation or something. Maybe Burkina Faso is like the most striking example of a country that actually was consistently starving all the time until they started to build socialism when they were able to become food self-sufficient in a matter of like three or four years and completely solve the food problem despite of being one of the poorest African countries. Like even that argument, it's just they basically say that because some communist countries have had starvation, therefore communism causes it. Whereas most capitalist countries have problems with food, like countries in Africa, countries in Latin America, Asia, India. Like, they all have bad problems with food, but nobody says that it's uh, because of capitalism, even though it actually is. Because it could be solved pretty easily with socialism, as has been done in the past. It's, instead, they just point to, like, couple separate instances taken out of their historical context they say like oh there was a famine in china therefore communism must have caused it and there was a famine in ukraine therefore communism must have caused it when in both of those instances scientists have shown very convincingly using actually strong like rigorous evidence to show that um it was environmentally caused. It was caused by just droughts, heat waves, floods, uh, plant disease, and other factors that just caused the crops to fail. Uh, I think in Ukraine it failed the crop two years in a row, and in China it failed for many years in a row. The um, the crop just failed. Which, uh, if the plants just die, then yes, there will there will be starvation. Actually, the whole. Um, the idea that communism could cause a famine, it's actually pretty interesting Like to think how you could actually cause a famine. Like, what would you do? It's not like you can actually cause the weather to be so bad that the plants die. So I don't know how they actually imagine that that would be possible. Yeah, I, I just view it as like, uh, it's just another like random hit piece, another anti dumb anti-communist argument, because there, there's plenty of capitalist countries that uh, have famine and are starving all the time. In fact, you know, most of the <laughs> the countries that are starving today are capitalist countries. And even if we look back, um, like when there was a lot more socialist countries around, socialist countries tended to provide better qualities of life compared to other capitalist countries. I remember the CIA actually like uh, released some of like its documents like way back. And th one of the documents that they had was that like about the nutritional value. Yeah, yeah. You know, like the average Soviet citizen compared to the average American. And they discovered that the average Soviet citizen actually has more calorical intakes than the average American, funnily enough. So yeah. the, the fucking average of like Russian in the Soviet Union was pro probably was like more fat than the fucking average American. I don't care about the weight, but I do remember in that same document you mentioned, they, they also mentioned that the, it's much more likely that um, Soviet citizens are eating more healthy as well. So they're eating like healthier foods. Yeah, they said that it's more nutritious. It's similar caloric intake, but it's more nutritious. Yeah. People don't know this, but India is actually much more starving than North Korea, which is... Like, people usually say North Korea is, like, the most starving country or, like, the worst example in this, but India is starving more than North Korea. And, and like, North Korea is a really small country which it just doesn't have enough farm area. It doesn't have enough farmland. The only way that North Korea could be food self-sufficient was if they had really intensive mechanized agriculture, which they used to do in the 70s and 80s, but they don't anymore because now there's energy sanctions and they can't get enough fertilizer and enough fuel. So it's been imposed on them. Also, North Korea was the industrial center for the Japanese before World War II. The South was the agricultural center in Korea because yeah. it's like more flatland geography. So basically splitting the country and two made North Korea just more in a worse situation. And another thing, too, that's interesting to point out, like, yeah, in North Korea, 
they they got pretty screwed by like the division of the country because uh, you know their their land is you know not very fertile or like or not good good enough like landscape to even have a good agriculture sector but it's interesting to note that since people want to say that communism like will always cause like famine or whatever like the biggest like example of like communism or like socialism at the ussr like as soon as basically as soon as the ussr fell the dprk had like a really massive famine and that's because they relied on a lot of food that they got from the ussr like the ussr not only was able to feed its own citizens it was able to feed like millions of other people like around the world that were also in communist countries um so like the the idea that like it causes famine is it's ludicrous on its head yeah north korea relied on getting uh cheap oil and just in general getting uh, like raw materials and fuel from the Soviet Union but when when that stopped and now there's all the sanctions they can't get that so if they have problems with food it's actually because of a really weird artificial situation that's been forced upon them whereas something like India India has plenty of farmland like there's no actual reason why India couldn't produce enough food food to feed its people but it's just capitalism and imperialism is keeping it so underdeveloped that it fails to do that. Yeah, there's a, there's another really this is actually an example that uh, I I would say had a pretty big effect on turning me into a a, a communist is uh, I, when I learned that in Venezuela, um, which obviously we have their issues our issues with them like they kind of don't really crack down on like the bourgeoisie in their country. They, it's kind of chaotic because of that, and they don't like really do much against them, but but. Uh, when I, I found out that a lot of like the bourgeoisie in Venezuela were literally hoarding like all types of different resources, including food, uh, like within the country in like giant warehouses, and, shit. and uh, thankfully uh, in a few cases the government like seized the material in those warehouses. But just the idea that like these rich capitalists, rich like traders to the country, basically, that are literally trying to like foment like a narrative about like the Venezuelan government that try to be like basically creating an anti-socialist or anti-communist narrative here that like it, it oh like socialism inherently causes like famine or uh, people to starve and stuff you know like it, it's literally created by them like they are hoarding the food yeah and people might ask well how is it possible that in venezuela for instance how can the capitalists actually just stockpile all the food and uh, prevent people from getting it and how can how could they possibly just get all the food and then hide it well the reason that Venezuela is so uh, vulnerable to this type of economic sabotage, which this is textbook stuff, they did the same in Chile back in the day, this, this has, like, they've done this before, but the reason that it's possible to do that in Venezuela is because Venezuela used to be a neo-colony, so it just produced uh, oil and other kinds of things like that for, basically for imperialist powers. And as a result, they don't have a developed, varied economy. Their economy is heavily focused on just producing one main product, which is oil, and then everything else is underdeveloped. So they don't have a developed agriculture. So they rely on food imports. They have to import food into the country. There's basically companies that bring food into the country, which are capitalist companies. And then those companies, they bring the food into the country, and then they hide it, or in many cases they secretly take it out of the country again. The only way to stop that from happening would be A, the state needs to take control of imports and exports and they need to import all the food and control distribution themselves, and they need to develop a, an actual agricultural sector. The country is in such a bad state because capitalism hasn't provided them with an agricultural sector. So, what I think is the worst anti-communist argument, um... I think the human nature argument is pretty bad. I also might have said the human nature argument, but another one that's maybe the most common, or it's certainly like in the top three most common arguments, is basically what I would call the Stalin killed people argument, which is that Stalin was a bad guy, he killed a bunch of people, therefore communism is bad, or communism is wrong, or something. It's like such an incoherent argument that it's almost not even an argument. But that's basically what people say. They usually don't formulate it as blatantly as that, but that's the implication. They, um, they say Stalin committed atrocities, and then that is supposed to imply 
that communism inherently leads to atrocity or that uh, it's somehow inherent to communism that there's going to be mass killings and whatnot. I mean, why do people talk about Stalin all the time? Like, it seems a bit random, but that's basically why. It's because they imply that if Stalin was bad, therefore communism is somehow wrong or doesn't work. Because it's a, ve it's a very about about it sort of argument, you know? Like, oh, do you know that communism, like, killed people? But then, like, we look at the history of cap capitalism, and then we have, like, like U.S. presidents that, like, killed, like, probably killed as m many people as they claim Stalin did. Like, yeah. George W. Bush, for an example, he just, he invaded Iraq, he invaded Afghanistan, pretty much made the U.S., like, stay, like, 10 years in, in, in like, in Iraq, and, like, 20 years in Afghanistan, and they killed just so many people, just so many civilians, just so many children, just so many innocent people, and they really got out of there, like, scot-free without, like, even any type of, like, uh, opposition to them. You know, you have, like, people like George W. Bush, who are, like, not even one generation ago, who probably killed as many as, like, one million people, if not more. I mean, even more recently, we have, like, Obama. You know, you, you guys remember when, like, Obama was just, like, drone striking the entirety of the Middle East? That that wasn't even 10 years ago, by the way. And that's still so recent. So, uh, if, like, they say about, like, how many people, like, communists killed, like, we can just do, like, as many people as, like, capitalism killed, really, for, like, for no reason except, like, uh, corporate greed. And like so called national interest. I think it's just like a the idea that saying like you know, Stalin kills millions of people and they're just fo hyper focusing on Stalin is just like a lazy argument. It's just like they're trying to put this great man theory in place to where they try to like, you know, put everything onto this one person and try to make them seem like an overarching, like ruling dictator that had complete control that could not be challenged in any way, shape, or form. But like even the CIA themselves, like, noted that like the U the USSR had collective leadership even during the Stalin era and like they do the same thing with Mao too you know they say like oh they had like ultimate power and everything but like there's so many other figures that were that also had like power and they were and sometimes these people were like at odds with you know Stalin Mao uh, and they were around for a while but that that it's just like they don't want to do the research and like actually learning these people and like learning the like, actual history of communist countries so they just instead shift everything onto the one person and say that, oh, because of this one person and their absolute power, uh, communism is inherently bad. Like, you, you could do the same thing to them and try to say, like, oh, well, King Leopold II in, like, the Congo Free State was horrible and uh, literally caused the genocide. Uh, so therefore, capitalism is really bad. Or you could do, you know, the same thing uh, to, like, uh, like, some of the British ru rulers and shit. You could list so many of these, like genocidal, actual genocidal capitalist leaders that the West has supported, like Syngman Rhee, who killed like uh, half a million Koreans because they were suspected of being communist sympathizers, or like even Hitler. Pinochet as well. Francisco Franco. Even like Mussolini and Hitler, like, the way that they've constructed this argument is that they they act like Hitler didn't do what he did because of capitalism. He must have done it for some other reason. Even though, like, for German imperialist capitalism to work, they needed to have colonies. So they needed to go to war against, um, against the other colonial powers, against the Western powers, to, to get their colonies back. That's why the capitalists supported Hitler, and that's what Hitler was trying to do, is trying to get the colonies in Africa and also get colonies in Europe. Like, oh yeah, I mean, of course there was all the anti-Semitism and how he thinks that the communism is a Jewish thing and whatever, but, like, the capitalists, they didn't necessarily even care so much about that. They just thought if they could enslave all of Europe, and especially if they could enslave Russia, they would have so many people to, to enslave, and so many resources that they could get, and so many investment opportunities, that that's why they did it. People don't just start wars for completely random and dumb reasons. 
Or, I mean, even if there was one guy who wanted to start a war for a stupid reason, the capitalist class as a whole, or even a significant part of the capitalist class, wouldn't support that. It's not possible for one guy to just start a war willy-nilly. It takes the cooperation of entire classes of people to do that. So, you could very easily argue that everything Hitler did was exactly because of capitalism. It's really a disgusting phenomenon that I noticed a lot. And not even just recently, just like all the time. Like, uh, there's always people, like especially conservative people. I notice um, there's probably a reason for that, but uh, the, they always try to downplay the amount of people that uh, Hitler or Mussolini, you know, any other type of fascist dictator, uh, killed. And they always really inflate like people that like they claim that Stalin Mao killed. It, it's it's really really disgusting, honestly. Do you guys remember that whole speech by Candace Owens where she says that like Hitler was an all right guy, but oh, then yeah. he tried to invade other countries? That's the yeah. cons <laughs> that's the average conservative mind. Yeah, th that that speech was crazy. What? I okay, I haven't heard about that. Yeah, Ken Ken Candace Owens, who was like a famous U.S. like conservative online, she did a speech once talking about nationalism, right? And in that speech, she talked specifically about Hitler and said that Hitler had the right idea, but then he started to invade other countries and try to expand Germany. And that shouldn't be what nationalism is about. And it's really yeah. funny. It's yeah. really funny how, like, how much lack of self-awareness yeah, yeah, just crystal not insane racial uh, theories and racial discrimination, co concentration camps, that's all fine, just as long as they don't try to take the colonies from the other imperialists. <laughs> yeah, the, the interesting thing, though, um, that I was trying to say is that, like, over time, like, as we get new new information and you know, stuff like that, and the numbers of deaths uh, caused by, you know, whoever or whatever country uh, like, gets revised, and to be more accurate, it's typically been seen that, like, communist countries continually get revised downwards, whereas, like, uh, fascist countries typically get revised upwards by quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's even so sneaky that usually, like, Hitler's death toll, they usually calculate it by just, they just say, like, six million or something, just because that's the, the Jewish Holocaust. They also completely excuse the war, like, oh yeah, the war doesn't count, like, the tens of millions that they, they killed, like, what, like 11 million Soviet civilians in the war, and God knows how many civilians in other countries, but they don't even include that. <laughs> yeah, There's like right. 16 million civilians and 11 million like soldiers from the Soviet Union. Just from the Soviet Union alone. Uh, like, it, it, even though I've seen... Uh, the funny thing is that even people who, like, um, are studies that, like, are, I guess, a little more honest, where they're, like, revising upwards the amounts of deaths that Hitler caused, um, like, they still tend to seemingly ignore, like, Soviet citizens and soldiers. Because, like, uh, I, I've seen one that... I saw an article that said, like, a study that revised upwards that they found that uh, the Holocaust itself... Uh, so the Holocaust study uh, claims that the, the Nazis killed up to 20 million people. So clearly really? that doesn't... Yeah, clearly that doesn't include all of uh, Soviet citizens either. So it's actually probably higher than that, quite a bit. The Stalin death toll is a complicated subject because it, it comes down to, like, well, what do you include, like, um, who is actually responsible for the... Like, I mean, yeah, all the all the stuff about he killed 20 million or 60 million or 10 million, like, yeah, that is, that's just blatantly false. Like, no, I would say that no serious historian even claims that. Even though popular, there are very popular historians and even influential historians who still claim that, but it's not backed up by anything. So serious historians don't even claim that anymore, but the actual number is hard to pinpoint because it comes down to, I mean, first of all, they don't even really know the actual number. It's based on stuff found in the archives. It's not like they've actually yeah. counted bodies or anything. Like, no, that's never been done and probably will never be done. But it comes down to, like, if somebody somebody dies in prison, is that included in the in the death toll? If somebody dies for other reasons, is that included? If somebody is executed, is that included? Because, well, who whose decision was it to execute them and, what, you know, so on and so forth. With Mao, 
it's even stupider because like with Mao, it's all about the famine. Like they just say that the famine was entirely Mao's fault. Therefore, Mao's death toll is the death toll of the how many people died in the famine. Yeah, it's just crazy stuff. And it, you know, a typical response uh, when you like start getting into the actual numbers with these people, because they, they just assume when they make this dumb argument, they are just going to accept it or concede it or something. But if you actually like challenge them on it and you get into the details of this, the response that I always hear every single time is that, well, it doesn't matter how how low it was or something like that. Because they still kill people in the end, so it, 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 the number doesn't matter. So, like, my, my response is always then, like, uh, well, if the number doesn't matter to you, why are you bringing it up in the first place? Because every country has killed people. So, if the number is irrelevant to you, then why bring it up? So, clearly, if you're bringing it up and you're actually being serious, you're not just trying to shut down, like, conversation on communism, uh, tell me what is the arbitrary number that, like, to you, like, m- means this is just completely unacceptable. Yeah, like, is dropping a nuclear bomb on civilian cities, killing hundreds of thousands, like, is that, that's an acceptable number of just random civilians killed for, you know, pretty, pretty flimsy reasons? The Bodo League massacre or something like that. People were killed just for being, like, suspected of, of being communist. Yeah. Like, and thousands of people. And I doubt that they had any kind of due process, like, I, you know, oh, yeah. they, I, I doubt that they had any time to carry out any kinds of in- investigations. Or even, like, the, all the atrocities in the Vietnam War. It's also interesting, like, when they talk about communists killing people, they always focus on maybe the most famous communists, or the most famous communists where they also have some way of sort of making the argument. Like, Stalin actually was the leader of the country w- during the time when they had, like, the Yezhovshina, the the Purge, or whatever you want to call it, the terror. So he's one of the most famous communists, and also he was the leader of the country during that period, so they can try to pin that pin that on him, and then come up with some kind of crazy number. With Mao, yeah, he's pretty famous, and also there was the bad famine, so they try to pin that on him. But then there's countless communist leaders, and... You know, there's no evidence to suggest that they committed any kind of, like, mass killings of millions or tens of millions of people. I'd say there, there's a reason why uh, people in, like, nationally oppressed countries are flying like the hammer and sickle many times. You know? <laughs> they, they, it's, they, they've typically been on the correct side of history, like, fighting for national liberation. So, to, to like, claim that, like, oh, they're just completely bad, terroristic um, killing machines that just kill everybody and genocide anything in sight, like... It's ridiculous. Yeah, if anything, like, the the Finnish Reds in the Finnish Revolution, they practically didn't carry out any atrocities. Sure, there were some individual soldiers who, like, killed some guy without any kind of permission, let alone any kind of order from the government to do that. The government was strongly against any kind of killings like that. You know, they were an extremely peaceful government, despite being a revolutionary government. There's one uh, British historian named Anthony Upton who actually says that the, the, the Finnish Reds were almost ideal Christians in how merciful they were to their enemies. It was almost like to the point of absurdity, whereas their enemies, the capitalists, were ruthless, put all their enemies into concentration camps and killed tens of thousands of people just for like being suspected of being communist sympathizers. But nobody cares about that because like they don't say that oh, this indicates that communists are all, like, good people and they don't do anything bad. No, they just completely ignore that and just uh, focus on some shit that they've made up about some other country. Yeah, around here, there have been, like, in Brazil also, been, like, extreme uh, anti-communist, like, violence as well, especially at the time of, like, the military dictatorship. Like, several people would just, like, be brought and tortured to death, or just, like, summarily executed as well. And, like, uh, the way that Brazil got its democracy back uh, was with a pact that was made between the military and, like, many, like, exiles and, like, political activists against the dictatorship, which basically meant, like, that, like, everyone would get amnesty like, political amnesty, so, like, the communists would be able to, like, be legalized, like, the people in the exile would be able to be back in the country, but all those, like, people that, like, tortured and killed civilians, like, killed innocent people, like, made others, people miserable, yeah, they'd be able to, like, go scot-free as well. 
which which is like just a huge scar in Brazilian history, which has not been healed today. Because these guys, you know, that did all the torturing, like killing, they they stayed in politics until now. They're still in politics, by the way, even today. They're still saying like the same stuff that they said in the sixties and seventies and eighties. That you know, you need to fucking kill the communists because they're like trouble and they're gonna like bring poverty to Brazil and that sort of stuff and like it's just crazy that you know like these sort of people are like the ones that control the the narrative about who's like the bad guys or not so Ator what do you think is the what was the strongest anti-communist argument that you could come up with I think the strongest anti-communist argument that like people can come up is the fact that the Soviet Union collapsed. Because independently of whatever we say, like any debate about like communism or socialism, like even among socialists themselves, always comes back to the Soviet Union as a whole. Because really they were like the, you know, the socialist superpower. So the fact that the Soviet Union just, like, collapsed, you know, their attempted socialism, their experiment, like, failed, basically just destroyed the entire communist movement around the 90s in, like, practically, like, every other socialist country just, like, went together with them and just collapsed in itself. So, really, the fact that, like, we always have to come back to the Soviet Union for literally everything. It's probably like one of the strongest arguments that they can use because, oh, if the Soviet Union collapsed, then what the hell is your argument? Like, you, you guys already had your chance, you failed. So, what are you going to do now? You know? Still today, we still feel that because no one knows what to do. Because the Soviet Union is gone. And that's sort of like a crazy thing. Because it just left a huge ghost on the history of like socialism and communism as a whole. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that you said that. Because I would have never thought that that's a strong argument. Like to me, obviously I've heard that argument a million times. But I've, I've always thought that it's a really bad argument. I agree. about It is a pretty bad argument. But I, to be honest... I mean that, and I even DM'd you about it. Involved that I don't think there really is many particularly good arguments against communism, but uh, obviously there's ones that take longer to debunk and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the idea that like, um, oh, the Soviet or socialism is bound to fail because the Soviet Union is like no longer here. I, I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> it, like, first of all, it ignores the fact that there's cap there are capitalist countries, obviously that that fell from capitalism to socialism, and then uh, they had better economic results after they had switched over to socialism than what they had previously had. Uh, and same things for, like, obviously, like, same feudal countries. And th this is also to say, like, uh, if they say something, because something is no longer here, that means it is, like, completely bad or uh, wasn't successful, no matter how, like, horrible it was. I'm talking about, like, old ancient empires and stuff like that. Like, they're basically saying, like, if those old ancient empires are not here anymore that they were pretty much complete garbage to begin with um mm -hmm. which i mean for, the, for their time they were successful in the time obviously because uh, otherwise they wouldn't have been as big as they were but you say that you you don't uh you don't think that there are any particularly strong anti-communist arguments well i mean I also thought that, but I thought, like, maybe I'm just so somehow close-minded or biased that I just can't think of any good arguments. Like, maybe other people could come up with something better, but, I mean, I asked a bunch of other people. I mean, like, the, the reason why I say that, like, the Soviet Union collapsing is a, is a, like, technically a good argument, because the collapse of the Soviet Union just left, like, a gigantic, you know, shockwave through the entire, like, uh, political spectrum in the 90s right after it collapsed like uh you know in, in europe like most communist parties generally like the second or third biggest parties 
in their countries. The Italian Communist Party was like practically like the third biggest party in Italy at the time. So were the French Communist Party, like many others. And then the Soviet Union collapsed, and then like all of a sudden, like the entire just this world goes into like crisis mode. The entire communist movement around the world goes into crisis mode because the Soviet Union collapsed. So that just left a, a huge, you know, like impact on everything. Like people legitimately abandoned communism because like the Soviet Union collapsed as a whole because they thought that like, oh, if the Soviets were like the the greatest superpower, like the second greatest superpower failed. Like, in the struggle, then, like, what hope there is for us, you know? You had people like Francis Fukuyama saying that, like, oh, you know, like, it's the end of history. Mm -hmm. And that sort of stuff. Capitalism prevailed. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree that it had a huge impact, and it still has a big impact, and tons of people stopped being communists because the Soviet Union collapsed, and they thought that, okay, this proves that the, the system doesn't work, or that it's uh, not possible to, like, there's nothing they can do anymore, or whatever. Yeah, I, I agree, but it's still a bad argument. Like, it, um, there were so many attempts to have revolutions to set up capitalism originally, to try to overthrow feudalism and create capitalism, and so many of those failed. It took centuries for capitalism to actually finally become a successful uh, functioning uh, system that could actually be sustained and then for it to become the leading world system took you know also took centuries the idea that because something is destroyed therefore it wasn't superior like therefore it wasn't better like that's just a complete mistake in logic like if you you know take like chile for example or or, or even finland like finland could have become a socialist country we had a socialist revolution and all the policies that the Reds wanted to implement were really good policies that would have benefited the vast majority of the population. And I would call the Red government the highest point of Finnish civilization. But then Germany invaded and killed everybody, and then it didn't happen. Like, we didn't get socialism because Germany invaded and killed everybody. So, does that prove that socialism is not good? No. It just proves that the socialists weren't strong enough they didn't have enough military power to protect themselves or or whatever and in this in the case of the, the soviet union yeah the soviet union was defeated in the cold war and it also uh, became ideologically revisionist for a number of reasons that's why it was defeated they stopped being socialist but it doesn't prove that socialism itself is not infinitely superior to capitalism yeah, there, there's another aspect here as well as, uh, well, obviously, we all know there's different kinds of anti-communists. There's obviously, you know, the anti-communist conservatives, anti-communist uh, liberal, I mean, liberal in the American sense, you know, progressives, sock dems, whatever you want to call them. But all those types of different people say this, these type of anti-communist arguments. Uh, but it doesn't really make sense uh, from the sock dem, you know, progressive side to make this big argument. Uh, unless they are in favor of neoliberalism, which which is kind of strange. But uh, what they don't realize is that the Soviet Union, by its mere existence of being an alternative to capitalism, uh, literally, it's it's what caused a lot of the like Western countries to adopt you know more like reforms that will benefit the people in those countries themselves. Um, so like it it the the fall of the Soviet Union led to like not only like mass like uh liberalization of like obviously all the a lot of the uh former soviet bloc countries and uh, uh allowed the imperialists to like have free reign over the colonies and stuff like that but it also affected uh people in the first world where a lot of uh western countries started to have like mass austerity measures you know like privatization efforts and general like neoliberal policies uh, being enacted with the fall of socialism and Soviet Union. Finland has had chronic high unemployment, permanent mass unemployment ever since the Soviet Union collapsed. Since that point, there hasn't been any time in Finnish history when we haven't had mass unemployment. And at this point, it's just been accepted that mass unemployment is just a permanent phenomena that cannot be fixed and 
it's almost impossible to like people don't even they don't treat it as an emergency anymore they don't take any emergency measures to try to solve it they just accept that it's like just a fact of life now yeah so like even if people are they if they're not convinced of being communist themselves they should still obviously support communism being a thing throughout the world even if it's not in their own country or whatever because it still will inherently benefit them because like their ruling class is going to be forced to like make some more concessions to the people of that that country because there is an alternative that's why it's so important to like build like more socialist countries here we need to have an alternative to neoliberal capitalism so they don't just screw us all the time flashy what do you think is the strongest anti-communist argument that you can come up with uh i think it's um the obvious one that we hear a lot especially from like libertarian people in terms of like uh market economies versus planned economy and uh planned economies are they claim that they're more uh, inefficient and uh the idea of like having to meet certain production quotas is inherently uh a bad thing you know, like it, it's going to inherently cause like uh inefficiencies and cause people to either be disenfranchised from working like disincentivized because the quota is too high or um if it, if they set the quota too low uh people will just meet that quota and then kind of you know screw around or like pretend to work and not really uh contribute much more past that quota but uh, that's not really a question of like communism or planned economy in general like we, even in capitalist countries uh, in like companies in general <laughs> like there's economic planning going on there, there there is uh quotas that need to be met by you know like end of month uh, we need to meet this goal and stuff like that and if you actually read like management type of theory and stuff like that like just like regular like business management type of theory it's always been a thing in like typical business management theory to like learn the the the, the sweet spot for setting quotas mm -hmm. um like if you set so obviously if you set the quota way too high people are just going to think well that's impossible to meet so like we're not even going to really try that hard and if you set it too low, obviously it's what's going to happen. They're just going to meet that uh, without even really trying much past that, uh, just so they can goal. You have to set the the uh, the quotas to a specific point where uh, it's difficult but possible to meet, and that's how you get the best efficiency out of that. And in terms of like um, just economic planning in general, or saying that planned economies are inefficient, well, I think that uh, technology itself has like massively improved since like uh the soviet union days uh so we would if anything we would it, it would be, be able to like implement a planned economy even easier than what it was like back then like it, it would be, you'd have a much better chance of like fixing all of this stuff the large multinational corpor corporations what a lot of people don't recognize is that a lot of them implement quite a bit of planning in the back end of things like it's not entirely market oriented like on the back end like uh for for example like Walmart has um like a bunch of like set agreements that they that they continually renew with specific suppliers that constantly renews like shipments and everything without having to like debate over like how much they're going to pay for this or that or something like that like they have set agreements with suppliers that automatically like refills like all shelves like refills everything that they need to get through to to um the specific stores and Walmart actually has a satellite that like takes in all this information um and like sends like notifications to, like where specific goods need to be sent to meet demand you know like modern technology with like uh in terms of like getting information uh from the bottom up and then sending it back down this is a very common thing these days and they they literally have tried uh to uh implement like market forces at like Sears before this was the downfall of Sears by the way Sears uh, tried to implement like a market forces like Ayn Rand type of like free market uh, style system within uh, internally of Sears, and it caused absolute disaster. It caused mass inefficiencies. Different departments were like competing against each other, like to the expense of the other. It, it, it was a disaster. Like you have to have like pretty much like economic planning within these large companies to actually create efficiency. It, it's something that people don't want to talk about. It's very common with something like walmart they plan all the production to be as effective as possible within the company itself but then the planning is based on completely irrational goals like it's all meant to be 
profit oriented so they that's why like that's why lenin said that in imperialism even though you have more centralization and more planning in a way it's still impossible to kind of plan capitalism because yeah you can you can plan all the production but it's still all done for profiteering purposes and for entirely irrational purposes like like let's say that they they produce food and then if people can't afford food well they just don't get food and then all the food gets thrown away or something which it just leads to completely irrational outcomes even though the actual production process and even the distribution process could be planned really efficiently there's also the fact that they're in in capitalism of course every company plans themselves but then they still compete against each other so it still causes chaos but even assuming that there was only one company and there was no absolutely no competition it still would lead to irrational outcomes in the context of capitalism but at the factory that I work in I literally have a quota and if I don't meet the quota then the management is going to ask me well why didn't you meet your quota and I have to have some kind of explanation like oh, the machines broke, or I ran out of materials, or like some, for, I had some justification for why I didn't meet the quota. And I would imagine that if you don't meet the quota all the time, then you'll eventually be fired. But we don't have any kind of incentive to, like, everybody at this capitalist factory only does the bare minimum, because you just have to meet the quota, and that's it. There's no, you don't get any kind of benefit for over fulfilling the quota or something which in in the soviet union for instance if you like over fulfilled the quota they they would actually reward you for that but in capitalism i'm actually not sure why they don't want to incentivize people to produce more like sometimes they say that it's because of quality that the quality would become worse if people were trying to rush and produce more like as fast as possible but that's not really the case because there's quality control and if if you're quality is bad they'll complain to you and you know you also will get shit for that i mean and then you got to take into account like <laughs> capitalism uh, has a lot of planned obsolescence as well it's obviously like if they sell you a light bulb that's going to last 10 years they're not going to get much money out of you they're going to get much more money out of you if they make a light bulb that lasts like six months or like a year or a couple years you know an important thing to realize too that especially among like people who uh, consider themselves like uh, marxists or whatever you know that like are more market oriented and they're kind of against planned economy to like realize like, like like what you said earlier like how although these companies capitalist companies do a lot of planning they they plan according to you know basically irrational um principles and ideas like according to like the profit motive and stuff like that instead of like human like need and like it, you know a, a, according to like how how what specific things are needed Going back to like Marx and Engels, how they would talk about like the anarchy of production and stuff like that, you know, like it's completely irrational to have planning according to uh, profits instead of people and uh, competing against each other in a, in a market and stuff like that. It's completely irrational. It, it doesn't. It, it that in itself causes inefficiency. The most basic aspects of capitalism cause mass in- inefficiency. Like capitalism never runs at full productive capacity. Unemployment lowers wages, so it actually makes, from a profit standpoint, it makes sense to have as much unemployment as possible. But from an efficiency of of the society standpoint, unemployment is extremely inefficient because then you just have people who don't do anything, they're unemployed, and then you, you still have to probably feed them and sustain them. But, like, it's completely inefficient. The amount of empty factories, just like, in, in general, like, any type of, like, uh company and stuff like that the amount of times i see an empty building like that it's just baffling like we could be using this for something you know market economies like they're subject even if you're like a market social or something they're going to be subject to the falling rate of profit in general like you can't sustain a market with, without like attaining like some level of like profitability here so the idea of like maintaining the profit motive the market forces is just insane uh, like you're going to be led to uh, like in, like they do in imperialist countries they attempt to raise the you know the, the amount of profit they bring in is you know they'll ex- exploit the third world and everything like that and bring in like imperialist super profits so like it, but in doing so it, it also takes away jobs from people that are within the country uh, because they're being shipped overseas so I tried to come up with the 
the best anti-communist argument that I could possibly come up with, or what I think is the most convincing. And I thought about this pretty hard, and I eventually came to the uh, conclusion that I would probably say that it's the idea that revolution, uh, revolution in general, or just building socialism and building communism, building a world communism, that it's just too difficult to do. To me, that's maybe the strongest argument, because you could think of so many reasons why it's difficult to do. Like, carrying out a revolution is so difficult, there's been so many revolutions that have failed, and the capitalist powers, they're so strong, they could defeat any state, they could just put sanctions on you, start another Cold War, and they could win the Cold War again. There could be revisionists inside the um, communist movement who somehow managed to take power in some kind of plot or whatever. Or there could be some other kinds of uh, mistakes that are made and then the capitalists win. That's probably the strongest argument that I could come up with. But it still doesn't really convince me because in order for somebody to prove to me that communism is impossible. They would have to prove to me that capitalism can exist for all eternity, which is just, that's impossible. Like, I could never, I could never believe that. This is how Marx came to communism, is that he saw that capitalism has so many problems, so many internal contradictions which are completely impossible to solve, and which will inevitably lead to the collapse of the capitalist system. Capitalism just becomes more and more impossible every single day, every single year, and Capitalism can only temporarily prolong its existence. Like, the collapse of the Soviet Union actually prolonged the existence of capitalism by a lot, because they, because capitalism could get investment opportunities in, in uh, Russia and Eastern Europe and whatnot, and capitalists could do things, like, they, capitalists could launch austerity measures in the West without the communists benefiting from it the way that they would have if the communist movement had been bigger and whatnot. But all the basic problems of capitalism still exist. Capitalism is still eventually going to going to run into the into terrible crisis. And no economic mode of production in history has ever been eternal. They've all always been temporary. We've seen it with the primitive communal system, with the slave system, feudal system, and it's it's going to be the same with the capitalist system. We've already seen that it's possible, even though it's difficult to overthrow capitalism, it's been empirically proven that it's possible to overthrow capitalism. There's been many successful revolutions, even though there's also been many unsuccessful ones. And even though the Soviet Union was defeated, it's still, you know, for a first attempt at a socialist state, it became the second superpower in the world, the second biggest economy in the world. It lasted for almost a century, basically, the communism defined uh, entire last century, basically. But I could still see why people think that it's just too difficult, especially these days when we're basically living in a in a new dark age when the communist movement is only starting to recover from the disaster, basically. And we also have to do a bunch of reevaluating and understanding uh, how it was possible that revisionists could come to power and how the Soviet Union was defeated and in these kinds of times there's also a ton of sectarianism, also a ton of opportunism. It might make some people think that communism has failed, but uh, I think we can learn from history like Lenin talked about this a lot after the 1905 revolution failed and how after that there was a huge increase in opportunism, huge increase in revisionism, huge increase in sectarianism, and also a ton of people just stopped being communists and just started doing completely other things because they thought like, oh well, the revolution's failed, what can you do? Like, we've also kind of seen this already happen. So that's why I'm, I'm at the end of the day, I'm optimistic. Yeah, definitely. I, I do definitely hear this argument uh, quite a bit, unfortunately, um, especially from like more, <laughs> ironically, libertarian socialist types and uh sock dems and stuff that they, they'll say oh you know revolution it, it causes too many issues the outside variables that come into factor of like maintaining a stable like socialist society um but i'm not very convinced by it because i, I don't think that uh just because like socialism is not really around anymore or at least on a like, global scale you know like to the effect that it once was 
I, I don't think that means that it's like gone forever. Uh, I, I think that it could it's very easily come back, and I think that people, even in the first world, are they're starting to wake up to the ills of capitalism. Yeah, interesting that you did bring up Lenin as well, because I feel like we're I feel like we're going through the same type of thing here um, that he went through. Uh, with like you know growing opportunism growing revisionism and i think this is one of the uh, strongest arguments that they t- th- those types typically make uh, they'll, they'll say that like you know uh, the revolution uh all that stuff like marxism and re- revolution th- these things uh they were good ideas but they didn't work and they caused too much instability so we should just take uh certain things from those ideologies uh that are practical and we could actually implement uh, but it- it's just blatant opportunism in my opinion like it's it's pretty much just right revisionist and uh you know sock dems that are just trying to um stop like the revolution from like moving forward uh they just kind of want reforms uh so that they could just improve their personal lives or something like that they don't really care about um the goal of communism in general i don't think they really believe that they want uh you know a classless stateless society their world. Yeah, I suppose like somebody might argue that even though capitalism is not going to be eternal, that there's going to be something entirely else, something entirely different, that it's not going to be capitalism or communism. But that also to me sounds like a terrible argument to argue for some kind of third path. Like I don't see what that could be. There's a great scene, maybe this is a good way to wrap this up so there's a great scene in a soviet movie called uh the youth of maxim where uh, this communist revolutionary it's it takes place after the 1905 revolution has failed and this communist revolutionary he's uh just out there on the street hiding from the czarist secret police or whatever Uh, he goes into a house to hide in or goes into a, a building to hide there and then he meets another dude Uh, And he recognized the guy, and it's like, oh, it's you. Like, you used to be a revolutionary just like me. Hey, what's up? What are you doing? And then he he says that, oh, yeah, the revolution failed, and, you know, I've become a reformist because revolution is just never going to work. Like, I've just become, like, an establishment reformist who works within the system. And then he goes, like, he goes with his reformist friends to, like, drink and have and drink and party and be like yeah revolution failed but we'll just try to like fill the void inside us inside ourselves with just partying and pretending that it's all good and like whatever just escapism because they just don't have the strength or the courage to keep fighting anymore and then uh, then he s- he says to the revolutionary like hey you should come with us like come come with us and like just have a good time just party and then He's like, nah, I'm good, and he just leaves and uh, keeps being a revolutionary. So you can, you can choose like which one of those guys you want to be. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to be the the doomer reformist, or do you want to be the Chad revolutionary over there? <laughs> <laughs>